your success really excites me. And that's the ultimate goal to make you guys successful. Another one day is Thursday, September 26, 2024. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. Thanks to my peeps over there on YouTube. This is the Insomnia Cast, as you may know from GoToWebinar. So thank you for being here. All right, we're going to talk about. Well, obviously, current market conditions, as usual, I have plenty to say about that, especially now. Your favorite stock picks, your questions on trading, crypto picks, too. And the methodology in action, we have a mystery chart update. I want to talk a little bit about the TFM 10% system, just a brief update on that. And then an altcoin trade and touch point of Landry 100. There is a, a Roger that. Why are you calling me Roger? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to continue my series. I had a couple of things I want to cover this week on a million little things, but we should have plenty enough time. If there's something you want to talk about, just feel free to, to start asking now, and I'll be happy to to cover it. This is Claiming Green. As you know, you can lose money trading. I was off the summit up. All predictions are about the future. Yeah, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. It's from Greg Morris. There's all my contact info. Take a screenshot if you want, or if you're watching on YouTube, obviously just hit. Pause. This will be live on YouTube or published on YouTube, the edited version, on Friday, September 27, as early as possible. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. No new mystery charts this week. There really hasn't been any setups in quite a while, uh, since the 13th, I think, of September. And I will flesh that out in a few more, in more details in a few minutes. But for now, let's get through the methodology in action. So here's the CLOV, and it's been a little bit of a disappointment. It hasn't anything wrong just yet, but it hadn't done anything right either. Anyway, those were the parameters, entry of three, stop at two, IPT of four. Very volatile stock. I forget the HV on it, but it's up close to 100 on a 50-day historical volatility. So that's what it requires. Anyway, uh, big blue arrow pointing higher. Also, lots and lots of Landry light. Look back here, you can see lots of Landry light. And then in more recent times, Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. My favorite moving average for this is the 30 EMA, for what it's worth, but the 20 EMA. I don't know you want to party with me, but it used to be my favorite. And now I'm, I've, uh, I have an affinity for the 30 EMA. It's probably not a huge difference between the two. Anyway, you can see it pulls back and notice that uh, it did. Touch the moving average, and then land your light when that happens, it goes to zero, and then you had one or two days, and then back to zero again. Anyway, it's uh, back above the moving average, but one thing that's interesting is that obviously it triggered, and so far it just hasn't done anything, but it did have a little bit of a rally, and that tiny little bit of rally, the, posi the open position based on 100K account was worth $400. Unfortunately, at the low today, it swung all the way back down to the downside. Now, the point I'm trying to make is you just have to get used to these swings and longer term, that's where the money is. And then obviously, if you're in a longer term trend following position, the swings get bigger and bigger. And that's why we take partial profits. I don't touch upon all that in just one second. Anyway, it could be a little boring just sitting there watching a stock go mostly sideways. I don't believe in dead money. Dead money has little or no chances of any further appreciation well you never know that because you never know what's what the market's going to do so we'll sit in positions for a long time in fact i'll show you one that we sat in for a couple of years and a lot of that time it was doing nothing but it turned out to be one of our biggest winners in a long time all right let's take a look at the tfm 10 percent system real quick and then i want to show you a crypto trade these zones in here inspired by jeff who's here tonight the 10% zone down here means you're 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. At the top of this zone here, the green zone, you would be exactly the 50-week closing high. So you can see, based on this, this is a weekly chart for what it's worth. It's a weekly system. So based on today's close, we actually close at an all-time high. The weekly chart actually looks a little bit better than the daily. Anyway, there's the rules. It just has to, it has to close 10% or more away from that 50-week closing high and also close below the 50 week simple moving average. The moving average I added in as a whipsaw filter. Now I added it in several years ago, maybe five or six years ago. But anyway, the system has been unchanged since, even though there's been 
couple of times where I've thought, well, I haven't seen this thing in real time for the last five or six years. We might change some things. So it's like, nope, let's just leave where it is and see what happens. Anyway, uh, the buy would be, the buy's a little bit more stringent. You need two bars of Landry Light, meaning two lows greater than moving average. And you have to be within 10% of the 50-week closing high. So bar one, bar two. So you would buy on close. This original research was done on a calendar basis. So I filed this on a calendar basis, meaning that on Friday, if you if all this works out and you close above the within the 10% closing high and you have two bars of Landry Light, that would be a buy on Friday. Same thing goes for a sell. We'll have to close the week below the 50-week moving average and 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. I told myself tonight, I wasn't going to go through all the rules, but I, I find myself doing it anyway. Anyway, to stop out, you would have to drop all the way down to this level here. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is the 50 week moving average is catching up to the 10 percent line so if that 50 week moving average gets above the 10 percent line then the 10 percent line just sell right now it's below it so now your 50 week moving average a close below that not a dip below you'll notice every now and then you might get a dip below it but a close below it would be a sell signal now nasdaq did not stop out it came close to a 10 percent or the q's i should say 10 percent loss here but even that was well above that 50 week. Anyway, as I've said a thousand times for S and G's, when was that? Back in 2023, March or April, end of March, I think. I bought 100 shares. If you go in, can't sleep at night, watch some old weekend charts where I show the actual trade that I took, just 100 shares. And I figured, eh, 100 shares, who cares, right? But actually turned into real money, which is kind of cool, but a good problem to have, but a problem nonetheless. But you can see 50-week moving average is still below that 10% zone, so that would be the sell signal there. And notice here, at the top of the green zone, that would be the 50-week closing high, so we just made that there. If you go back to the S&P chart, you can see that that green went up a little bit, that zone went up a little bit because we're at all-time highs in the S&P 500. Anyway, at the peak, I'm sorry, uh, based on a, a mark to market of where I grabbed this chart a little earlier, it was up 16,000, almost $17,000. And then at the peak up here, it was up even more. In fact, I'll show you the drawdowns here just real quick. So with a longer term trend following system, especially without money management, you will have some really abysmal drawdowns. Your accuracy is gonna be super low too. And again, not to beat the dead horse, but that's why I've developed the hybrid money management system where I'm taking partial profits. And I'll touch upon that in just one second. But anyway, that $8,000 spill was uh, was a little, I'm not going to say nerve wracking, but it, it, it all of a sudden this small position became real money watching $8,000 evaporate. Anyway, this was a crypto trade that I talked about in last week's Dave Landry's the week of charts. And now keep in mind with these, these altcoins, or as I like to call them, shit coins. And I know that's a little vulgar. It's S-H-Y-T is what they call them. It's a little vulgar, but it kind of reminds me that these things are, are, are made to trade. It's kind of like trading sardines. It's the old story, I'm sure you all heard it a hundred times, but the sardine price was getting really, really, really high. And one guy paid the top dollar for a, pair, uh, a can of sardines. And he goes to open them up and they're rotten. And then he goes back to the guy who sold them to him and he's like, you stupid fool, those are for trading, not eating. And that kind of exemplifies the, the shit coins or, or really any stock for that matter. My daughter was asking me, did I ever invest in a company or trade a company I didn't believe in? And it's like, well, I, I don't care what the company does. And and uh, this, I explained to her, I said, uh, I bought a coal stock. I, I knew it was energy. I didn't know it was coal a few years back. Not that it would have mattered. Now, I do have, I did have one client that I know of that told me he didn't buy it because he doesn't believe in coal stocks or doesn't believe in coal. Or, it's like, well, you know, if you're going to trade, you're going to trade. And, and my clients are paying me to find stocks. And I can't say, oh, I don't like what this company does. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to buy that stock, you know, or Maybe maybe you like a company and it's it's a short. It's like, ah, I don't want to short it because I like the company. Well, don't confuse the issue with facts is one thing that I often say when it comes to that. So you really have to have to not care. And like I told a guy who didn't buy the coal stock, it's like, well, look, you know, buy a coal stock and then 
make a bunch of money off of it and then go plant a bunch of trees or, or whatever you want to do with that money. Anyway, I, I understand some people bring their ethics into the uh, trading. Oh, goodness. Oh, it's you, Jeff. Okay, okay. So I did a seminar a couple of weeks back. I know I'm going to last week in band camp, you're deaf at the TSAASF conference, annual conference. And I've spoken there three times over the last 15 years. Great bunch of people. By the way, you don't have to be in San Francisco to join. And uh, you can do a lot of the stuff online and they have great speakers. Bollinger was there, Damon Pavlatis was there, Linda Rasky. They, they always have the who's who and sometimes me <laughs> speaking. Uh, but anyway, I was wondering because uh, we're going to get to that trade at the end of this presentation and just to kind of show a point. And one thing that I pointed out in, in the seminar, I wish I'd, I'd known it was you, Jeff, because one thing I wanted to point out is that I didn't adjust for um, the dividends. And I've never rarely have I owned a stock because I'm trading momentum that has dividends. OK. So I didn't think about adjusting the stop lower. And Jeff did that and he's still long. So that's that's awesome. That's exciting. So let me know when you stop out. We'll 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 do a chart on that and um and maybe we'll get you into the webinar to talk about it. Anyway, uh I would never never say never, but I try not to show you a trade here like ah, I just showed you the best one. I try to only show trades that I recommend ahead of time. But in this case, I don't tend to recommend altcoins. Although, if you guys that are in my Facebook group want me to, I'll be very happy to. In fact, we've been it's been a little quiet in there lately, so I'll be happy to to throw in a few altcoin trades. Trades now. Remember, this is kind of S and G type trading. This isn't my bread and butter. But when these things go, they can really go. And what my goal here is to just see what I could do for fun and and parlay small accounts. But they do have their uses as far as there was a gentleman that was struggling with trading in the aforementioned seminar last week at Bandcamp. And one thing I didn't think about telling him at the time, but he could he could go in and trade these these altcoins with with a very little tiny bit of money to get the reps in. When when you're trading and you want to become better at trading, just like if you want to become better at anything in your life, you, you've got to get the reps in. And one thing I was thinking about earlier is like reps are important, but you got to you have to get in quality reps. Okay, it's sort of like the the ten thousand hour rule, the Malcolm Gladwell type of rule. You need ten thousand hours, but you need deliberate practice. You need to work harder to getting better. So if you make ten thousand trades or spend ten thousand hours trading, if you're not constantly working to get better, then then that's that doesn't really do you any good. So anyway, I think all coins are one way to get the reps in. You get the ups and downs. And there's a bear market every six weeks here, sometimes every six days. And there's a, and there's a bull market somewhere in between every six days or every six uh, weeks. So it's a lot of fun. Anyway, the entry was there. I took profits here. Now, keep in mind that I'm not a breakout trader. But if you're trading a highly inefficient market or... A market like 1999 in stocks for those of you who are old enough to remember that it's funny <laughs> talk about 1999 people are like what what was that you know <laughs> anyway uh, but back then everything was crazy and just going straight up you just buy stuff going straight up and sometimes in trading you can such as sometimes the ipos you can do that and in certain markets occasionally like these altcoins when they really begin to take off so i do sort of trade breakouts in all coins I prefer to trade like a pullback or something like that in general, but I will trade breakouts in all coins. I will trade breakouts in IPOs too, because they're wildly inefficient or certainly can be. Anyway, in the all coins, just to keep the math easy, I just use 20%, okay? So if I'm getting in at 48 cents, I'm flipping out at 58 cents in this particular case. Now, one thing I did as I was putting together this presentation or putting together this slide is like, you know what? I've done this mining thing, so to speak. And as I've said quite a few times, I've looked into miners, of course I did, because I'm a nerd. <laughs> and then I figured out that it's a it's a would be a horrible waste of money. If anybody knows knows how to mine Bitcoin at home and actually make money at it, let me know. It just doesn't seem like something that would lend itself well to a to a private individual. 
especially with the cost of power. Now, if you got cheap power somewhere, then by all means, buy yourself a little miner and plug it in. But then there's all the problems. So I figured like, well, why not stay in my wheelhouse? And if I can make money on these altcoins, maybe turn into a little Bitcoin here and there just for S&Gs. And so I mined off, so to speak, $25. Now, you know these things are going to likely spike and come back in. But if I could take a little crumb here and there just for S&Gs again and put it in a Bitcoin and see where, see where it goes. Now, I'm not an investor. But so if it ever became something substantial, then, of course, it would be hard for me to hold on uh, like Michael Saylor through all the ups and downs. <laughs> but for now, I think it's just kind of a fun way to, to get a little free Bitcoin, so to speak. And then later in the presentation, we'll talk about free positions and the importance of that. But anyway, so there's the mining transaction I did earlier today when I was putting the slide together. And I just sold a tiny bit of, bit of this. And this thing might implode tomorrow. And if it does, I got an extra $25 out of it. And I threw it over in Bitcoin just for S&Gs. I know you're probably like, wow, this guy. <laughs> I'm so impressed. So if you zoom in, I didn't have a, a, a particular pattern in mind, but I do remember looking at this the day after it would have triggered on the 230, I'm sorry, yeah, the 220 EMA system, which I now call a 230 EMA system. And you're just looking for two bars of lantern light, lows greater than the moving average, and then you're looking to buy above the highest high of those two highs. That's the entire system. If you Google uh two slash 20 ema breakout system it was in stocks and commodities in 1996 i think i'm dating myself a little bit anyway you had two bars of landry light so the 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 230 ema breakout would have been on that day there i don't recommend you rush out and trade this 230 ema type of system mechanically but every now and then I'll look at charts and I'm amazed that you'll get a signal, it doesn't trigger, get a signal, it doesn't trigger, get a signal, it doesn't trigger. You get four or five of these whipsaws and I'd be willing to bet that if you took a signal after three or four of those whipsaws and these whipsaws don't trigger, which is kind of crazy, that this stupid little, which is I, which I actually use as a whipsaw filter, by the way, in the TFM temperature system, but this stupid little system will avoid a lot of whipsaw, which I find quite amazing. Anyway, I'm a nerd with all this stuff, but that was a, that's when I, I saw this uh, shitcoin was rallying and then I ended up buying at 48 cents, like I said, 48 cents and change. And then again, I put that IPT at 58, but uh, it was going up and it had bottomed out for a long time. And I thought it was uh, kind of cool looking uh, just because it hadn't made this big old fat bottom. It didn't have a whole lot of overhead resistance for a while. So I figured it was worth a shot. But anyway, that's my thinking on that one. And, and again, you guys in Facebook, I'll start posting these trades ahead of time for the altcoins. Now it's heating up again. All right, let's talk about the Landry 100 just real quick. Like I said last week, basically the reason I'm doing this is just kind of proof of concept that you that you in some cases with a lot of caveats, you can just buy markets going at the new highs. Now, if a market's going from A to C and B is somewhere in between it's going to have to pass through B on its way to C. And that's the whole buy at B or the basis of the buy at B in the IPO and the IPOs. Now, I don't recommend you just buy new highs, but if you're buying a big basket of stocks, like 100 stocks, and I don't actually buy these stocks personally, although I was thinking a little while ago, I was getting ready for, the, for this uh, webinar. But at some point in time, maybe my next life, I might just run a, a portfolio of this maybe in, in retirement, which I don't see myself doing. But, <laughs> you know, maybe I run a big portfolio of this and that's that's the main thing that I do. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I did run this list, so to speak, years ago, and I forget why I stopped. I think the software I was using to track it, they no longer made it. And uh, now I'm tracking the spreadsheet, which now I remember it's kind of a pain in the ass, but it's not, it's not nearly, it's not impossible. It's just an extra little work every day. But anyway, when I ran it years ago, a couple things I noted that um, one, it prints money in momentum markets. Uh, two, it gets absolutely crushed every now and then. And what's kind of amazing is this list will get crushed usually two or three days before a major market sell-off. Sometimes the S&P will make brand new highs and this list will get crushed. 
the the only thing is I don't have that daily equity on it like I used to. So if somebody knows an easy way to, to put all this into software and do it with the daily equity or some software out there, let me know. But uh, for now, I'm just it's kind of proof of concept. I just want to maintain this. And it also does a couple other things too. It makes sure I'm seeing the the NVIDIAs of the world and the hot stocks. And they might not set up for my core methodology, but at least they're on my radar by managing this momentum list. So that's that's um, pretty much it on that. Any questions or anything? Okay, so, wow, Jeff said, take the dividends off the stop. Yeah, that's right, that's correct, because the stock is gonna adjust down for whatever they pay on the dividend. And uh, he said it pays 280 a year in dividends, and that's a lot of money, especially for a momentum stock. We'll have to take a look at that one. Uh, let me just put it up on my chart so I don't forget and see where it is. Wow, that's that's a wild that's a wild and crazy ride there. Okay, so Landry 100, you can see nice move. Oh, also as I pointed out last week, this one's still the number one in the list. But notice that the day I put it in, the next three or four days, it just absolutely imploded. So if you were just trying to buy the new highs, I think it'd be a very difficult way to trade. But if you're buying a hundred different stocks or at least hanging on to 100 different um, different ones and doing that constant window dressing like I talked about when I described this earlier, then uh, it can work, okay? Especially in the momentum market. Now, keep in mind that if we start going into a bit of a downturn, first time I ran this, I was going to always try to keep 100 stocks in it, but we went into a bit of a downturn and I just couldn't find enough stocks to keep 100 stocks in the list. And so I ended up with much, much less than 100, and cash is treated as an asset class or a slot. And maybe this time I might throw some ET. I did throw a few ETFs in, I think, early on to get up to 100 and to get some exposure in certain areas like semiconductors or whatever. But I think maybe next time, uh, not inverse ETFs, because those are kind of tricky for longer term holding, as I've discussed before. The um, you get a bit of a decay, so to speak, in those. You got to watch that. But anyway, um, maybe next time I'll throw some bond ETFs or whatever into it, and we'll see what happens next bear market. Anyway, uh, this one's pulled back a li little bit since last week, but it did have about a 70% run uh, as of uh, tonight's close. So John says his uh, cost is now 749 on that ARLP. That's so cool that you were able to that you were able to hold on to it that long. <clears throat> anyway, so here's the I just grabbed the top of the list. Uh these well, these are the ones that stopped out. And you'll notice they had some pretty substantial gains. This NNE, we'll talk about that one in just one second. That was one that was in the trading service. It was also an IPO before that. Now to my surprise, and I guess I shouldn't have been that surprised, if you add them all up, you'll miss some negative ones down here that are not shown. But if you add them all up, you'll see that this is actually slightly in the negative by about eight tenths of 1%. And this was started, I think, late May, early June. So yeah, late May, uh, May 29th. But the reason this is negative is because I'm pulling out more losers than winners. And the other thing I want to run by you guys is, again, there's no money management. This is just kind of a proof of concept type of thing. Sort of like the TFM 10% system sorted out. But anyway, um, I'm wondering if if I'm up 100% on a position, should I pull half of that off? And that's something I'm kind of noodling with. And that might be um, an interesting thing to do. Anyway, um, you guys in Facebook, I'll... If you want the list, I'll be happy to publish it there. Okay. A while back, I came up with the idea that, you know, trading really isn't like one big epiphany. It's a lot of little, little, little tiny things. And I remember when I used to go to, to seminars, initially I was like, I expected that I walk away with all this information and be like, oh, I'm gonna make all this money and everything. But it's like, I didn't, that didn't happen. But what did happen was, excuse me, a little 
a bunch of little things that a bunch of little gems, so to speak, that I would accumulate. And everyone thinks you're going to have this big epiphany when it comes to trading, but it's actually literally almost a million little things. Now, number 123,262, I will trade for growth and not income. Now, you see all these YouTube ads, of, you know, make $500 a day or whatever, and, and all this other stuff. Well, trading for income is extremely difficult in markets, but trading for growth, like my friend Jeff here, who's still in the ARLP, he's also a client, he's doing pretty good and he's getting $2.80 a year in dividends on this thing. And so he's he's done quite well with that one stock and that, that growth is huge. And I'll show you that stock in just one second. Income strategies would be something like selling options. And that's a great way to have a very brief but brilliant career on Wall Street because sooner, sooner or later, you're going to get whacked. Now, I've kind of mixed in two things here. I kind of mixed in patience along with trading for growth because trading for growth requires a tremendous amount of patience. And that's why I showed a little bored lady earlier looking at her laptop because sometimes you'll get bored to death waiting for these stocks to, to move or stop you out, worst case scenario. Anyway, Livermore, I spoke about Livermore two weeks ago at Bandcamp, right? The desire for constant action, irrespective of underlying conditions, is responsible for many losses at Wall Street, even among the professionals. I haven't showed, again, a setup in a couple of weeks, and I got a couple of clients that are like, come on, Dave, you got to find something. I'm like, well, I'm not seeing anything, and if, not, if I'm not going to put capital in harm's way, neither should you. And as I've said a thousand times before, Back in the trading markets day, they had salesmen who would call me and beg me to put some stocks on my trading service. And I wouldn't do it if I couldn't find anything. And, and what they've observed was if, or I've observed the same thing, if I would recommend stocks and they would just, they would fail miserably, you know, throw some turds out there or whatever, we'd lose a few clients, but not too many. But if I didn't recommend anything and I explained to them in careful detail why we're not doing anything and why I'm not doing anything and why you shouldn't do anything, we'd lose clients. And and it drove the, the salespeople nuts. Anyway, the desire for constant action irrespective of underlying conditions is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even among the professionals who feel they must take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. I am a little guilty of that because I have all these screens. I've got one, two, three, four. I got five double monitors, so technically that could be 10. And then I got one big screen TV, so I don't know how you add all that up, but I have a lot going on and it, you can really get sucked in very easily to a lot of trades. By the way, and I, I think, I don't know if this was in one of the um, previous webinars, I'm sure it was, but whenever I get whacked a little bit doing some intraday stuff, which I shouldn't be doing as much as I do, but whenever I get whacked a little bit, I back off and then I say, you know, I'm only going to enter this on a stop above the market and try not to do too many market orders. And I'm always shocked at how many bad trades I would have avoided by doing that. So if you really want to be in the market on an intraday basis, right, and you see it going up and you think it looks pretty good, put it in a stop order a little bit above where it's trading and you're gonna be shocked how many times you're not gonna get triggered on that order and how much money you'll save by not putting that capital in the harm's way. Now here's one that I tweeted out recently. There are times when playing the stock market that your money should be inactive, waiting in the si on the sidelines in cash waiting to come into play in the stock market, time is not money. And that's a hard thing to kind of wrap your head around because we have all these, these expenses now. It's like, I used to never look at grocery prices. And last night I wanted to make a ribeye stew and ribeyes were like 20 something, 20 something dollars a pound. And I couldn't bring myself <laughs> to pay 20 something dollars a pound to, to make a stew out of ribeyes, you know? And I'll, I'll go Friday night, I'll, I'll, I'll get some and, and grill them up. You know, that's a different story. A little sous vide and grill them up, just a little salt and pepper. Mm, so good. 
but I couldn't bring myself to do that. And I used to never look at prices. My wife, back before groceries were high, would always send me to the store, especially we had to buy a lot of uh, high dollar items or expensive things because I never cared about prices. But anyway, it's, it's changed now to where you feel like, geez, I need to generate some money because everything's so damn expensive. Anyway, time is not money, time is time, and money is money. Often money that is just sitting can later be moved into the right situation at the right time and make a vast fortune. Patience, patience, patience is the key to success, not speed. Time is a cunning speculator's best friend if he uses it right. And then the next line he said, remember the clever speculator is always patient and has a reserve of cash. As I often say, and I've almost sank a couple of times offshore. One in particular, I really remember because I remember my brain was never clearer in my life. <laughs> we were a couple of hundred miles outside of Bermuda, maybe maybe three or 400. I think we were halfway to Bermuda from Charleston. And we were above the, what is it, Mariana Trip Trench? I forget what it's called. So the, you know, two miles of water. Not that it matters once you're <laughs> once you're 10 feet or more of, of five feet or more of water, you know, it's 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 deep enough to drown, obviously. Um anyway, we were sinking and uh, it was a it was a scary, it was very, very, very scary thing. Turns out we figured out what the problem was, fixed it. Uh no big deal. A guy actually did like a what's that movie? Titanic, like a Titanic thing where he swam down and 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 got the sail out of uh, a spinnaker pole and we began to slowly bail out um scared man in a bucket best bilge pump ever <laughs> anyway the point i'm trying to make there believe it or not i have one it's better to be on the dock drinking beer wishing you were out to sea than out to sea wishing you were on the dock drinking beer and i've been there a few times the desire to maximize the number of winning trades or minimize the number of losing trades works against the trader the success rate of trades is the least important performance statistic and may even be inversely related to performance so that's one thing about momentum is it's skewed okay and it depends upon the occasional outlier and as i've said a thousand times before i gave a speech once and i got pulled aside afterwards for a little constructive criticism and said you know dave and this was the guy who invited me was peter monthy he invited me to speak in dallas probably 15 years ago he says, you're making it sound too elusive. Well, it is a little elusive. And that one little outlier sometimes is key. And I might have three losing trades and one big winner. And I'll do incredibly well with that one big winner. And and client will call me up and say, Dave, I'm I'm going to bail on the service. I can't make any money. It's like, why? You know, what's going on? And you're like, did you get this one, that big winner? And it's like, no, but I got those other three turds you recommended. So it's like, okay, there it is. But trying to be super accurate, trying to be in and out every day, trying to just take that income out the market and read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, read How to Trade Stocks by Jesse Livermore, and also read the biography by Smitten, who's, who I found out over the weekend is, is no longer with us. Smitten had a bar down in Key West, and then Jimmy Buffett bought it, bought it, uh, bought it from him. Um, Jimmy Buffett's gone too, huh? Jeez, bummer. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyway, so I like what Mr. Eckert says, maybe inversely related to performance. And you got to be really, really careful with the in and out, in and out, and all that other stuff. And a lot of times, you know, I'm guilty too. We're all guilty, I think. We're all trying to make things happen every day for some of the affirmation reasons. But the bottom line is be selective, be patient, let the market come to you. It's amazing when I'm doing my scans. I was explaining to my clients earlier tonight. It's amazing that when I find setups, I usually find setups within the first two to three minutes of my analysis, okay? That I love. They just jump out at me, I flag them, and I'm like, I just had this good feeling like I got what I need. I already got what I need. I'm going to take another look at them. We'll, we'll take a look at everything else. I'll do a complete analysis, but, but I got what I need. I, I have all that I need right now for the next trading day if there's nothing out there like tonight then i find myself just looking at charts looking at charts looking at charts hoping that something will magically appear well what i'm trying to say here is let the market come to you the best setups will jump out at you after 
you have a little bit of experience, you'll have that F yeah feeling where you feel like you'd be stupid not to take the trade. And if that trade failed miserably, as I've said a thousand times before, you would say, so what? If I saw this trade again tomorrow, I would take it. All right, number 433003, establish free positions when offered. This is my favorite thing in the world to do. This was the NNE from a while back. There's the parameters. This ULS also turns a free position, but it said stopped out as has NNE. Entry was there, stop was there. Again, we have initial profit target. And this turned out to be one of our quickest big winners. But you can see this thing, we took partial profits within a couple of days, it absolutely blasted higher, and then we got stopped out. Now we did give up a lot of gains, and that's a bit of a bummer, that's a whole other webinar that I did just on that a while back. If the stock would have had options, I think life would have been a lot easier. But within a week or so time, and this is on a hypothetical 100K account, although these are my actual trades I took here that I'm showing you, but on a hypothetical 100K account, around 5% or $5,000. So just that one trade makes a $5,000 swing to the upside. And let's see. So that's uh, $4,000, $5,000 followed mechanically. Now, I, I applied a little bit of discretion, and I didn't quite get that $5,000 in my model account. But I did okay on that trade. Here's the ARLP stock that... Jeff was talking about, and it was in a nice uptrend. And this, if you back the chart way, 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 way out, this was a major low. This stock had bottomed out for a long time, and it was a Landry Light pullback, and it took off nicely. The entry was there, and I'll just go through it quickly because we've talked about this one a thousand times. One of my favorite uh, setups ever, obviously. And then we took partial profits, and then trail the stop higher. Now. Just FYI, because I did mention dead money, this thing goes weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and sometimes months without making new highs, okay? New equity, new highs from where you entered, right? Or new new all-time highs, I should say. So during that time, you're just, you're just waiting and waiting. A lot of times, like back here, for instance, this is kind of a Chinese water torch. It just goes down and down and down and down. It tries to rally, it goes down and down and down and down. And I guarantee you, most of my clients didn't stick with this thing for two years. Now, Jeff, I'm proud of you, buddy. <laughs> Jeff's been in it for four years. That's pretty awesome. So the real money is in these longer term trends and establishing free positions is key. I haven't figured out zero DT options. If you figure them out, let me know. And don't say I'm doing the butterfly reverse condor inverted spread. I don't want to even I don't even learn how to do that because that's just going to mess with my head. But anybody that uh, or maybe something simple like uh, ratio spreads, I'll, I'll I'll nibble at that every now and then. But the point I'm trying to make is anytime I put on one of these these speculative type of option positions such as zero DTE options, I immediately put in a sell order for half and today i've got two free rolls but everything didn't materialize i think i ended up losing a little money overall but i was positioned for those free positions where you you let the the market so to speak pay for your position through taking the partial profits anyway so that one stopped out another livermore ism men who can be right and sit tight are uncommon. Anyway, here's all the trades. I think I had a few more shares, extra 300, but I did flip those extra 300 out for a profit. But I think in the service, it was close to that too, close to $20,000. And again, the the OSMO, osmosis, you guys know what these people do? I have no idea. <laughs> and I don't care, right? Okay, don't confuse the issue with facts. I almost looked them up earlier. Whenever I find myself looking up one of these shit coins, it tends to jinx me. But anyway, so you can see this is a free position. So I'll follow up on this one in upcoming webinars, and we'll see we'll see what happens, good, bad, or indifferent, like I did with the TIA a while back, I think. Anyway, so that's a free position. That's the ultimate goal. Again, if you're buying a speculative option, a cheap option, then um, flip flip out half at a double to pay for your position. 
if you're trading these shit coins, flip out half at 20%. Eventually, I'm going to have to adjust the volatility, but that's what I've been using lately is 20%, okay? And break your stop up to break even on the rest. And if it goes to the moon, follow it to the moon. I got you, Jeff. All right, speaking of crypto, let's hop over to crypto real quick. If there's any pairs you guys want me to take a look at, I'll be happy to do that. Let me get my screen shared over here. All right, Jeff says, whenever it was that you said in the service that you saw it and wanted to add it, I realized we already had it. Whenever it was, I think what Jeff's saying is, so that's what you did add on trade. He said he did add on trade. Yeah, when I'm when I'm doing my scans, and I see a stock, I'm like, oh, that looks good. And then when I look at the ticker, I'm like, oh, I'm already long that. That's that's always a good feeling to have, obviously. And Jeff said that one day in the service, I pointed that out, and that's when he did a he did an add-on trade. Yeah, when you said you did an add-on, I was like, okay, that could be dangerous. You got to be careful. But yeah, I hear you. He did an add-on at 1450. And his cost basis is now 749 because of the dividends. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's really cool. I'm, this, this, you know, your success really excites me. And that's the ultimate goal to make you guys successful. And in the process, I become successful too. So as I say quite often, sometimes you can just short these shit, uh, sort these shit coins. That's hard to say. And, and buy the ones that are, that are the strongest. Now this one has a lot of overhead supply. But as we go down this list, let's just see that one looks too thin. When you see a bunch of little little marks like this or super wide range bars, tails, so to speak, usually it's it's not um, liquid enough to trade. This one looks okay. It's a little squirrely, as you can see, but it looks okay. So a breakout there could work. Let's see if they now this one's kind of interesting. Look, it's making some new highs in here. So that might be worth buying. It's breaking out. This is kind of a a 220. Thing. In fact, let me go ahead and the problem with um, <laughs> with doing these webinars is everything looks good. So let's do this just for just for S and G's. Let me let me buy some of this, and then that way I can say in high, uh, without hindsight that I went long this one. So let's see what's going on. All right, what is it? AXL. Hopefully, I can get in this platform. A A X L. All right, let's buy at the market. Let's do. All right, I'm long. So let me put a ticker in here. All right, so what I'll do is, let's see where I got filled. I got filled at 70.92. So just for educational purposes, let's do this. 70, 92, that was the fill, you just heard it, times 1.2. All right, so at 85, my IPT would be at 85. I'm just looking for 20 cents. So right here is IPT, 85. And now keep in mind, in stocks, I'd be a heck of a lot more selective. I'd be concerned a little bit about this overhead supply here and all. But I'm just trying to get a 20% pop and then trail a stop on these things. What's the moving average on the chart? That's a 30 EMA, which is my, uh, again, my favorite. You can see a little uh, one, two, what do you call this? Uh, 230 EMA breakout. But here's what I was saying earlier. Notice like right here, one, two, never would have triggered. And then on the upside, let's see, one, two, with a little wiggle room that may not have triggered. But I like this one now. It's kind of a, Kind of an inverted head and shoulders type of bottom, bigger picture bottom, and we'll see what happens. So, I need to make sure I put that order in at 85. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. So, at a limit of 0 0.851, 0 0.851, and we'll do half. Is that right? That doesn't look right. 0.851. I'll do it offline. Anyway, so that one looked kind of good, kind of interesting, I should say. This one looks like it's a little too extended. 
But you can see these altcoins, there, I said it right, or beginning to set up or rally at least. And when they're really strong, sometimes again, you can just go in and buy the stronger pairs like I just did. There's the Osmo. I'm uh, already long that one, obviously. Now, Mimi, I missed this one, or meme, I guess. I used to call memes memes, just to just to mess with my kids' heads. <laughs> oh goodness! And the argument over GIF versus GIF. <laughs> anyway, uh, take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin's doing okay. It's got a lot of overhead supply between 65-ish and 72k or so. I think it's going to have a hard time getting through that. But once it does, and it might have some fits and starts, I think it could be off to the races. Kind of a longer term bull. Shorter term, you can see lots of Landry light. I think about 10 days of Landry light. So it's beginning to get its act together. It just has a lot of overhead supply. Ethereum has been lagging quite a bit, but it's starting to bottom out. So that's a good thing. Ethereum versus Bitcoin, you can see it's just been abysmal. And by the way, somebody was asking a second ago, Brian, about the 30 EMA, as I preach, look how beautiful this is, okay? And as a general statement, never buy any market that's trading below the 30 EMA, okay? You're welcome. So look what happened here with Ethereum versus Bitcoin. It's just been dropping like a stone and never did get above the 30 EMA. It only peeped up recently in not a really meaningful way, and then it turned right back down. So... That silly little moving average could keep you out of a lot of trouble. If you don't walk away with anything tonight, but that, I think I paid for your, web, I think I paid for your webinar. How's that? <laughs> All right, let's shift gears. Let's get into stocks. Unless you guys, any crypto pairs? My YouTube brethren a little quiet tonight. Hello to you guys. All right, let's shift gears. Let's get stocks. And we're going to go to... Uh, let's still let's see this. I lost my little screen. Oh, here we go. Okay, there's that ARLP. And then uh, Jeff was in from way back here. This is with the signal. That's a pretty big drawdown in here. I don't know if I could have held through that, but I hear what you're saying. If you adjusted your stop lower, then um, then I guess that makes sense. Okay, let's take a look at the indices and then do a little drilling down to the sector action. So let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500. We did make new highs today and normally when we make all time highs, I get pretty excited. I just don't like this drift we've been having as of late. I'd like to see the market accelerate higher and not look back for a while and then have an orderly pullback if we're making a list of things that we want, right? NASDAQ Composite. Now, NASDAQ Composite has stalled short of its prior highs. It's, it doesn't have too far to go to get there, but obviously from today's close, let's see, about 2.5% round numbers, but you still have to get there. Now, I'm not a fan of patterns like a, but I've studied every pattern in the world. But something like a bearish Gartley, and if somebody trades a Gartley, let me know. But Gartley's uh, basically a, a, a hard sell off and kind of like an ABC up. Uh, if you could explain to me the psychology behind this pattern, then maybe I can wrap my head, head around it and use it. However, when I look at this chart, I do think I, I, I'm not super excited about it unless we go up another 3%, obviously, and bang out some new highs. I'm just concerned that I'm going to stall short of these new highs. As I think I told my service peeps this morning, or this afternoon, I should say, I'm kind of a man on the street kind of guy. And uh, one of the guys in the gym, he's long uh, either Russell or a short or, or a small cap fund. And he was saying that he was always, he's like, when I get, when I get to break even, I'm going to cash out. He, told, he said that last week. And then I told him, like, no, why don't you sell on the way back down? If it keeps making new highs, just, just keep trailing a stop higher. And then he told me that today he's like, uh, man, I was at break even for like 
a few minutes last week. And I can tell he's itching to get out at break even. So that's kind of a, a microcosm of what's probably out there. So that's one thing that's a little concerning with some of these indices shy of their old highs. Now, EFA shares, take a look at EFA shares. These are the world shares, right? Break it out with Vigor, their brand new high. So I find that kind of interesting. And usually we're the tail that wags the dog or the dog that wags the tail, however you want to look at that. But uh, this is, I find this fascinating. So I don't know if that what that means. We'll keep an eye on the situation and see what happens. Gold of commodity, look at that, all-time highs today. So that's pretty good. So finally, these idiots in the radio are right. You know, buy gold, is going higher. Well, why would they sell it to you if it's going higher? So that's a whole other conversation. Gold stocks are finally kind of waking up. They're kind of wide and loose and all over the place in spite of gold doing so well. But now they're beginning to wake up. So we could see some setups fairly soon in the gold stock. So I'm not, this isn't like a sideways choppy market that's been going sideways forever, the overall market that is, because the S&Ps obviously had brand new highs. So this isn't a market where I feel like we're not gonna ever have any setups. I think we're getting close to setups. I'm just being very patient and letting that market come to me. Obviously check back often though. Take a look at the IBB for biotech. That's got a kind of a minor triple top to it. So that's a little bit of concern. The point I'm trying to make with this analysis here, and I've been telling my peeps every night, is that it's super mixed out there, okay? So take a look at the banks, stalling short of the prior highs in here, a little bit of a bounce today, but kind of wide and loose and all over the place. And that's a market that you don't want to rush out and buy. Now, MAGS has been really improving as of late. It's gotten past this little resistance in here, this little witch hat, sold off fairly hard from it. But then it's made a new leg higher. And that's another one I was like, A, B, C, waves up. I'm not into waves, I'm not into Gartley, but I'm just, I just see it in a chart, pointing out. If anybody does, again, a Gartley or whatever, uh, number one, is it a Gartley? And number two, do you think, um, do you actually trade them? And can you explain the psychology behind it? And I'll be happy to share with everyone if you could answer those questions. Uh, but anyway, not too far away from these all-time highs. So that's a good thing. And these were the old leaders, the mags, Magnificent Seven. And it's good to see them coming back. So maybe what's old becomes new again. Usually in the stock market, by the time everybody in their brother is all excited about the NVIDIAs of the world or whatever, then the game is over. But that's certainly an improving thing. Biotechnology bases the MG Group. A lot stronger than the IBB, but you can see it's it too is beginning to lose some steam in here. So that's a bit of a bummer. I'm kind of a closet bull in biotech, usually am, but now I'm, it's beginning to look a little toppy in here. It's certainly lost some momentum. So that's of a little bit of concern. What is the um, what's the defense ETF? We can take a look at the ITA. Is that it? Yeah, so defense is looking pretty good. It's kind of a wide and loose uptrend, but you can see it recently made all-time highs. It's pulled back a little bit. If we pull back below this little breakout, and there's a lot of that kind of action out there. It's like things are breaking out, and then they come back in. So I'm not seeing the follow-through I'd really like in the market, so it's hard to get super-duper excited. Like, take a look at major drugs, for instance. They were doing fantastic, and then they kept pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. Now they're well below the 50 simple moving average. And they're not too, too far away from where they broke out. Now, it's not the end of the world just yet, but this is of some concern looking at the action in major drugs. Silver got the memo that it should be going up like gold. It did break out a couple days ago. It's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. Hasn't done much since, but silver certainly waking up in here. Semiconductors did an opening gap above that prior little peak. So that was a good thing, but then it came back in a little, still up on the day, almost 3%. But this is of some concern that we stalled out after just trying to get past this peak. Again, as I preach, one day at a time. Building materials, or is this, what is this, materials? Yeah, materials, break it out to brand new high. So that's kind of a good thing, obviously. Back to the downside. Take a look at OIH, which is all service. You can see it remains in a pretty serious choppy downtrend began to implode again today down three percent 
Real estate looking okay so far, just pulling back. I never thought I'd get excited about real estate. These REITs are usually boring stocks, but they've, they've become momentum stocks as of late. So who knows? I might be recommending a REIT over the next few days if this continues to pull back. Back to the kind of the mix situation. Health services has been doing really well, healthcare. But then it stalled out and it's rallying came back in. It's still in an uptrend, but I'd like to see some renewed strength. Metals and mining really woke up like they got spanked in the butt, right? But you can see stalling out a little bit the prior highs, wide listed all over the place, so really no setups there. Financials, none of those areas, kind of off to the races, got forwarded at its old highs, pull it back a little. Yeah, it's in an uptrend, but not a nice, clean, solid uptrend like I'd like to see. So you can see a lot of mixed action out there, and that's why we're probably not seeing a whole lot of setups right now. Now, any any individual issues you want to take a look at? Any stocks you want to look at? I, I doubt we'll find anything tonight. Seems like I've kind of exhausted all possibilities, but maybe there's something out there that I missed. Let me know if there's anything you want me to look at. And while we're in pass, obviously I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. Anything unanswered, you go to DavidDaveLandry.com. Any picks? Going once, going twice. Well, again, thanks, everyone. I'll see, I think most of you guys didn't go to webinar. We'll see you tomorrow and Facebook. YouTube guys, uh, have a good weekend. And everybody else, again, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. It made a trend. Be with you.